In 1902, uh, years before a government proposal to declare Kaziranga National Park and few others in the floodplains of the Brahmaputra as the secured habitat for the one horned rhinos came into being, Guru Prashanna Lahiri and several others, all residents in the Bengal district of Rangpur, wrote to Lord Karjan, the Viceroy of India, a rather long memorandum. The authors of this memorandum introduced themselves as shareholders of Karai Bari Zamindari in Gwalpara. This is largely area northern part of Bangladesh. This Zamindari includes lands from Garu Hills, a part of modern Meghalaya. The tone and the tenor of the memorandum was that of the Indian nationalist. Very powerful, very, very provocative. And it put forward rather a very moderate demand. Lahiris demanded that uh, compensation given out to them in view of their exclusive right to hunt elephants in their zamindari should be reconsidered. They had cited their rights, I quote them, rights of capturing elephants and other wild animals by means of kedas and of levying fees for granting licenses to hunters of wild animals, quote end. The government dismissed the claims of the zamindars, but not before swimming through a fiercely contested legal dispute is spreading over several decades, almost for three decades. This was not something unique. Throughout the 19th century, the zamindars of Gualpara, then the government disputed each other's rights over the elephant hunting. If the colonial government wanted to stake its monopoly right in the elephant hunting and trade, the zamindars considered elephants both as a source of earning as well as a marker of their territorial authority. What we see throughout the second half of the 19th century, a series of prolonged legal disputes over absolute property rights over a big animal. Behind the fat and the very voluminous legal proceedings, minute details of elephants, one can find rich and complex ecological details of a reason and an animal which help us to understand an environmental history of Asian elephants in India's northeastern setting. To be fair, there are rich histories of relation between environment and law, but my interest today is to explain how the complex environmental history of a big herbivores are interwoven with the contested history of colonial state making process. And to this, to do this, I have divided this presentation into four parts. First, I would like to briefly introduce the political economy of hunting and capturing of elephants in India's Northeast. In the second part, I, I have explained a complex forested and agrarian landscape where elephant founds place to live in. In the third part, by drawing on the rich details of the Karaibari Zamindari dispute, I discuss the complex negotiation through which Gwalpara Zamindars laid their claim of exclusive rights to hunt and own elephants. In the concluding section, I discuss the interplay of governance, nature, which saved the fate of big animals in modern times. My first part is with the political economy of elephants. At least since the 17th century, the Bengal Zamindars, traders from North India, and Mughal military officials all had their eyes on the elephants from this wider region of Northeast India. Why elephants were present here in abundance, I have limited expertise to suggest, but I will shortly introduce a broad picture of the changing agrarian landscape. Elephants in Eastern India had many roles to play in the pre-British era, as a war animal, as a royal gift, symbol of royal prestige, and source of profit for a few individuals. Within the, geography, the geographical territory of Assam, the capture and domestication of elephants acquired much sophistication during this period. The capture and domestication of elephants acquired sophistication and accounts of large scale transportation of elephants from Assam to the Mughal India in Delhi is widely available. Elephant capturing, domestication, and human elephant relation often became part of a deeper social meanings including wide range of elephant songs. Composed by popular ballad composers, 
Such songs were part of a social life of large numbers of communities. Parallel to this, the handicraft industry, specializing in ivory, also flourished in this region. The pre-colonial knowledge of elephant came from local practices, understanding, and observation. Apparently, such knowledge had two utilitarian perspectives. One was for the protection of paddy fields, and other one was for their capture, management, and domestication. All these have passed into oral as well as written tradition. Large corpuses of folklore from Western Assam are proof of the extensive transmission and use of local knowledge about elephant. The Hosti Bhitana book, which is very popular and well-known text for all of you, an ornamented early 18th century manuscript prepared under the direction of Dahun Kings exemplifies the extensive knowledge of the Assamese on the health and the well-being of the elephant. The manuscript, now available in the printed form, meticulously describes the several methods of elephant catch keeping, its breeding, domestication. The manuscript hints at how no one in particular is, was the chief patron of the elephants. Patronization was to be supported both by wealth and social sanctity. Trade in elephant allowed individuals to gain both economic and the social capital. These classes of people came to be known Hati Thoni in Assamese vocabulary. Amongst the chief agents of Assam elephant management and capturing in Assam were the religious heads, the Gusais and the Vaishnavite priest. They were also the chief owners of hunted elephant. Many of them lived on the profits earned from the elephant trade. The social practice of elephant hunting by the religious head continued even in the post-independent period. Then, Zamindars, Mughal officials, traders all had their eyes on the elephants from this wider region. Elephant from this region suddenly acquired significant commercial importance since the 18th century in the shadow of new economic and expanding colonial forces. Indian princely rulers, Zamindars, European traders, and East India Company officials all found comfort of travel and better social status in owning elephants. Elephants from this wider region met with new destiny. In 1770, Robert Lindsay, an official of the East India Company in Silet, which is uh, in the south of Western Assam, and popular hunting ground for elephants mentioned how, and I quote him, in those days when the country demands for them, either in the war or department or pirate, Lynch they described the profitable trade in elephants. The average price at a distant station was from 40 pound to the 50 pound. When sold silly, their price varies as much as Highland Pony to the first new market racer, quote ends. The elephant then definitely came to play an important role since the early 19th century. They came to be used for transportation of the colonial administrators into the flooded agrarian landscape, extraction of timber, clearance of forest for the tea plantation, etc. By the mid 19th century, the colonial government began to assert its monopoly right in elephant catching and trade. By 1855, the colonial government moved towards new rules declaring methods of elephant catching as state monopoly and a state subset. Debates over the ownership of elephant continued for another two decades. Officials continued to emphasize the absoluteness of the right owned by the state over elephants. By now, the colonial government had firmly asserted that, and I quote them, elephant is in Assam a royal beast and can only be hunted under government license, quote end. While such claim did not go unsilenced, at least till 1873, there was no distinct set of laws about the ownership of elephant. On the other hand, since the early 19th century, the government managed the tax of hunting and management of the elephant while they were captured through either CADA or government leasing out system. The responsibility of supervising the capturing and training of elephant was entrusted to the CADA establishment based on Indhaka, which came into the existence since the early 19th century. The CADA fulfilled several tasks. It monopolized the capture and trade in elephants and eliminated ferociously the community customs and practices. As a sequel to this high-end drama, 
over elephants. In 1879, the Elephant Preservation Act was enacted in India and soon extended to Assam. The act clearly recognized the superior and exclusive rights of the government. Hence onward, elephants became a protected species all over British India, though they could not still be sought in private, could be sought in the private lands, or if they proved to be dangerous to humans. It was in this context that the Western Garhils, largely as a part of the zamindari of Gualpara, became a highly contested place for elephant hunting and trade, both for the colonial government as well as for the zamindars of Gualpara. But why Garu Hills? About a fifth of the known world population of the Asian elephant, please correct me if I am wrong, are found in the northeastern region of India. This includes a wide variety, wide territory spreading in the areas of Gualpara and the Garu Hills in the western south bank of the Brahmaputra. To get a more clear picture of the 17,000 to 22,000 Asian elephants found in India, an estimated 1,400 elephants occur over in forested areas of Meghalaya. A substantial volume of this elephant population is found in western part of the Meghalaya, and large number of them occasionally sneak into northern Bangladesh, obviously without passport. Elephants are present in this area since long, but when what explains the presence of a dense elephant population in these areas? One probable explanation is a complex topography and habitat. An elephant habitat is largely defined by the availability of food and absence of trade to their habitat, as you all know from the works of Raman Sukumar. And I, uh, yeah. The elephants in the northeastern India share a diverse habitat from open floodplains grassland to dense forest. In 1879, W.W. Hunter, he was an official statistician of the British government, had uh, such a complex topography in mind when he wrote, and I quote him, elephants moved in the lower hills and gorges on the valleys of the Surma and the Brahmaputra. But more importantly, the Garu Hills varied ecological texture is also due to absence of the permanent cultivation. Archival records clear, regularly reported absence of settled agriculture and the prevalence of sifting cultivation in the Garu Hills. Failure to expand the settled agriculture in the hills came as a boon to the elephants, if not to the colonial government. Recent research on the habitat preference of elephants in the Garu Hills and southern bank of western Assam, largely coinciding with the territories from where the zamindars of Karaibari captured elephants, it suggested elephants here preferred June fellows. Forest, which appeared in June land, meant that elephants are attracted to a great diversity of food plants, less likelihood of these plants being protected by toxins and tannins, and a higher proportion of available food being within the reach of these most elephants. Garu Hill was also the major source of cotton production, but this significant volume of cotton cultivation hardly caused disturbances to the elephant habitats. As the Garu Hills and its foothills remained largely free and partially cultivated, Elephants made it their homeland. Unmindful of the fire's fight between the zamindars and the government, the elephants carried out raid on crops, plants belonging to the zamindars, government, or their subjects. I come to my next section, competing rights over elephants. The zamindars of Western Assam, including that of claim, uh, Karaibari, claimed exclusive and spatial rights over elephant habitats and hunted them for long spread over a very wide and complex ecological territory, zamindars, zamindaris, zamindars of Karaibari carved out distinctive privileges of elephant hunting for long. The Mughals considered them at the frontier of, frontier of their stern frontier. Distance and an ecologically fluid landscape created opportunities for the zamindars of Karaibari to emerge powerful. Control over elephant was an additional source of power for these zamindars of this frontier province. Definitely a superior privilege than the neighboring zamindars of Bengal. What was interesting that, even by the middle of the 19th century, Karaibari, characterized by low-lying hills, still remained largely a forested area with little cultivation. Out of the 800 square miles area belonging to the Karaibari, 
more than 90% was still forested in 1853 when the touring judge from Bengal, A.J. Moffat Mills, inquired about this cemetery. Essentially, proceeds from this foreign peasant-based agriculture in this vast zamindari state was extremely low. A low revenue from agriculture was replaced from the profits earned uh, from the forest products, from elephant hunting. Elephant catching was then surely a very lucrative trade uh, for the Karaibari zamindari. In 1870, the William Hunter described elephant hunting in Gar Hills in this way. A considerable trade in wild elephant is carried on and parties of native huntsmen used formerly to come up every from uh, Purnia, Rangpur, and Moimunshing to capture wild elephants. A lot of spelling mistakes. To retain control over their rights over elephant hunting, the zamindars resorted to various mechanisms. One was to assert control over the elephant catchers. The zamindars of Western Assam, including that of Karaibari and Mashapara, employed garus as elephant catchers. Catching elephant was and is still a highly specialized skill and involves substantial labor force. If elephant hunting was considered as a source of lucrative trade for the zamindars, the garus also hunted elephants for their meat. Keeping highly unsettled and mobile tribal population as labor force for the zamindars was also an intricate process. Meanwhile, after the extension of the authority of the East India Company into these areas, the Karaibari Zamindari underwent several economic constraints. The Zamindari was auctioned off and subsequently it was partitioned between several shareholders. This made the Karaibari Zamindari highly vulnerable and its survival was at stake. The new absentee Zamindari shareholders now tried their best to retain their right to hunt and trade in elephants as the only way out. Any decline in income from such sources was considered a direct threat to their existence. It was inevitable that they would resist any such attempt which threatens their economic and the political and the cultural privileges. However, since the second half of the 19th century, such prerogatives were silenced by the Assam administration, and in the 1867, for the first time, the hunting rights were prohibited. Actual silence, as I said earlier, came in the form of Elephant Preservation Act of 1879. Extension of this act into the zamindari of Gwalpara Karaibari was sure to raise hue and cry. Guru Prashanna Lahiri and others, the angry Karaibari zamindars, protested before the Assam Chief Commissioner, saying that the manner in which the conditions and under which profit, the profits of our elephant mahals have been realized and the exercise of our rights interfere with. They were not alone. Several zamindars having territorial claims over the Garu Hills have already put forward similar claims. In 1886, the Mesapara zamindars filed a lawsuit against the government seeking a declaration of their exclusive right of catching wild elephants in the Garu Hills and also their right to appropriate, and I quote them, the entire profits of their seed hunting operation without rendering any account to the government. Dismissing the notion of exclusive rights of zamindars on the elephants, George Anderson, the superintendent of Kheda operation in Dhaka, had categorically argued that the government had the exclusive right of hunting of elephants in these states on the ground that elephant is a royal beast and therefore belong exclusively to the crown and if not exclusively, that the crown has an indefeasible rights to hunt him. The Assam administration refused to extend the rights claimed by the Karaibari Zamindari. In an agreement signed in 1878, it was asserted that, henceforth, the government of India do not hereby recognize the right of Zamindar of the Pargana of Karaibari to catch wild elephants. The exclusive rights to hunt elephant in the Garu Hills claimed by the Zamindars was probably disputed by the Garus. Garus exacted a fine or cess variously known as a marang money or mati khazana for catching uh, each uh, in, for each elephant uh, killed or captured on their lands, whether by the zamindar or by the foreigners. The Assam administration categorically refused to extend these rights to the Karaibari zamindari. In 1875, uh, in the absence of no legal framework entitling the colonial government to assert its exclusive rights over elephants, opinions began to differ. 
rendered an exclusive right to be exercised by the government, offer of compensation was also made to the zamindars. Such conciliatory approach emerges both from the absence of sovereign right of the government, as well as practical difficulties of ensuring control without taking the zamindars into confidence. When Guru Prashanna Lahiri wrote the memorandum in the early days of the 20th century, the colonial government was in no mood to succumb to the pressure and finally confirm its unwillingness to agree to the claims of the zamindars, and the government became the exclusive owner of the elephants. Neither the zamindars, why would they abdicate a mass price social capital through earned through centuries of negotiation over local nature and people to the colonial masters whose fate is now self whose now uh, fate is still uncertain? I now come to my concluding section: nature, law, and environmental history. The protected legal battle fought by the zamindars of Western Assam amply proved how the big animals became a source of intense negotiation between Indian riches and the British colonial government. It was only after a long drawn legal battle that the colonial state was empowered with the absolute right over the elephant. This work then offers possibility to examine the rule of law and environment in ascertaining claims of the colonial government as well as the powerful zamindars over elephants. The hills, forested spaces, and revenue therein were not seen as an empty space, but an intrigue to the larger space claimed by both colonial government as, uh, government as well as the Gualpara Zaminders. One uh, cannot afford to do away with this economically lucrative space, but all legal and social negotiation must be used fruitfully to retain authority over such a complex territory and animal. Loss of ownership over elephants was seen both by the Gualpara zamindars as well as by the British government as a significant threat to their political and economic power. The zamindars took recourse to the social and the cultural access and capital to the elephants to lay bold claims over the elephants. In this high drama, and elephants not only acted as mediator between various forces at play, hills, jungles, zamindars, and colonial government, but was the active agent of the colonial economy. The extraordinary economic and social capital that the Gualpara Zaminders could enjoy gave them the required weapons to remain at the loggerhead with their colonial masters. Throughout the 19th century, the Zaminders, by citing their historical claims on elephant, contested sovereign notions asserted by the British government. Despite resistance and willing to negotiate in the 19th century, the Zaminders began to relinquish their rights, their notion of sovereign did not find many takers. In the 20th century, the legacies of the Gualpara Zaminders slowly vanished away. Elephants are still predominantly present, present in this space, but face different forms of silences, more environmental than legal that their Guru Prashanda used to face. Availability of habitat is declining rapidly with the coming of permanent cultivation. The new masters of the Indian nation stays and enjoys the rights of elephant, which was settled long before in the early 20th century. Thank you so much.